How you doing all? This is James DeBow hosting the show, Discover the New Things on Big Condo Radio. And um, we got a special guest in the house today, definitely familiar, collaborated with him many times. He's an author of many books. He's delved into acting. He's, he's a writer. He's, he's a poet, you know, and obviously he's going to explain his timeline a bit more about that. How are you doing, Patrick Graham? Good friend of mine. Yeah, well, you've already gave me a name, so everyone knows I am. But yeah, good to be here. Always good to be on um, Big Condo Radio. And um, I'm glad that they, they welcome me in. Uh, you're welcome anyway. Well, you know, we just do what we do naturally anyway. We have, you know, we go back and forth conversations on telephones all the time. But one of the main things is, is I want to deal with your timeline before we go into the importance of African history. Because I want to know, like, I mean, where did, where did you begin with African history or black history, whatever you want to call it, but you're going to define it. How old was you when you first got into black history? Um, to, to be honest, I couldn't actually put an exact date on it, but what I can do is put a time period because I know one of the things that fascinated me, even if I didn't see it as black history, um, yeah. but I had a subconscious questions in my head of, did the people really look like that? As when you've seen depictions of Egypt on TV programs and films and that as, yeah. as a youngster. But one thing that um, I was impressed with was the, the pyramids themselves seeing the pyramids as a youngster, you know, when you're six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and films and that depicted, that was like, wow. I yeah. love to see them. And, and and when you did see the odd image of a real image of an Egyptian tomb, that confused me because I thought, well, that doesn't look like the people who were playing them on TV, you know, Elizabeth Taylor's and that. But to say, when I very first got involved in Black History, I would actually put it when I was about 16 and just okay. over as a young volunteer in the Liverpool Lake Law Centre. And one of the people who influenced that is Solly Bassey, simply wow. because um, yeah. he was obviously working in there at the time. And just some of the stuff that he would just talk about an idle conversation. I remember one day me and Alan Gale went to this conference on um, youth unemployment and how hard it is for black people. As, and as a youth, I was forced, not forced, but I was, you know, put in to speak on the day, you know what I mean? Um, mm. And on the way back, we passed by what used to be a local black bush, um, bookshop, Source Books, that was it used to be a metal parade. And Alan said, you know, pick a book that, you know, you can read it yourself and then, you know, put it to the Law Centre Library. And I picked a book, the book that I found, interesting, there was loads there, I was like a kid in a sweet shop, so, you know, I could only look so much, but I found a book that said Blacks in Science, Ancient and Modern, and I thought, well, that seems to cover a lot of things, ancient and modern. I thought, well, that seems was the this place a, to start. Was this a black book shop, did you say? Yeah, yeah. It's wow. books. It was run by um, Adam Hussein. Okay. And yeah. um, it was called Blacks in Science, Ancient and Modern. It was actually written by Ivan Van Sertum, who's someone who Renoko Rashidi has oh, worked a lot in. Uh, and, yeah. you know, someone, Renoko is someone you're very familiar yeah, with. Benny, so yeah. that was my first real read of, of, of black history in that book. And it was... I'd say it was mind blowing some of the stuff in it because even reading it and he was quoting the facts and the references, it was still like, wow, is that really true? Because of all the indoctrination over the years growing up as a youngster that you'd have from TV and the media showing you different depictions of what is black history. So, you know, this era now, are we talking like the 80s? Are we talking or the 90s? Well, yeah, yeah, this is the 80s, yeah. So, show me age there. So, I was like, I said, in if I 16, yeah. going on 17. I mean, I'm only young then at these times. I the law center. So, and, you know, um, black history was never really the main topic of the area. But, you know, got into that that age. And, and throughout the 80s, mid 80s, a lot of um, American intellectuals came over to Liverpool and done lectures in different places, the Caribbean Centre, the Methodist, um, a place called the Gallery, that's based uh, just off Walker Street. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and as a youngster, young teenager, going up to 20, I got to encounter a lot of these. I can't even remember half of the names, you know what I mean? But, you know, one guy I remember was Leonard Jeffries and oh, know, okay. one or two other people. Mm. But um, they were really interesting, you know what I mean? So that got me, you know, at the lectures, there was always books for sales so or book books. I remember buying it. Um, Anthony Browder book. Oh, um, he's excellent in. Now yeah. Valley Civilizations. Amazing. And um, a few others as well, because I ended up with a collection of four and I'd like, say to my books and, you know, well, since then I've got I remember you said books. to me, I remember you told me when, the you know, when I brought Renault Rashidi over early this year, January, you told me, which I was unfamiliar with, that this is like what was going on back, what you're talking about now, back in whether it was the 80s or was it? Yeah, um, 80s, yeah, uh, mid-80s, yeah. Now, how did these things disappear? 
Well, that's just it. You know what I mean? They just, I couldn't say how, but they I did. Mean, you know what I mean? Because you, you, people grow out of it. And, and the 80s was a very changing period for Liverpool, especially, you know, for the whole of Liverpool, but the black community in particular, because the 80s, mid-80s scene, a move. Because just remember, you had the riots at the beginning of the 80s. Oh, and yeah, from yeah. there, you, you, you had... Um, Tory policies of managed decline and that battering of Liverpool and, 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 you know, I was young, so it was hard to understand it at the time. But looking back in history, there was a lot going on across the whole scope of Liverpool. So a lot of things were changing. And it was about, to be honest, it was, a, it was basically a war of culture, if you want to use it, that term, which was basically the government suppressing people's, um, just the peoples in Liverpool in general, black and white, but especially black as well and divide and rule and that. That helped fizzle out that, um, what you could call enlightenment, that search for knowledge, that search for, you know, what strengthened people, what unified people, because, you know, learning about your history, regardless mm. of who you are and where you come from, yeah. anybody learning about the history it gives them a sense of being, a sense of pride, a sense of place, oh. a sense of strength, a sense of knowledge, a sense of, wow, I thought we were this and we were that and we were nothing, but we actually come from a great stock, a great line, a great this, a great that. You know, that goes for most cultures, you know what I mean, can say that because some people are downtrodden and learning about your history can give you a lot of confidence to, to go forward. So I want to go into more than black excellence of some of the other stuff you've been involved in. Well, you, yeah. Like, like acting or, I mean, expect, wait, did you, was you acting before? You've oh, done, you've over done, the years, I've, got, I've been involved with all sorts because I, I was interested. Run us know, through your timeline then. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to put exact date, but I know as a youngster, them times, I did like acting, but I didn't do it. You know, I remember doing it in school as a youngster, a teenager, you know what I mean, drama and that. But as a, 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 an older teenager after leaving school, you know, I had a few mates who were into acting, but I'll be honest, for me, I know I was too cool to be doing that, you know what I mean? So I didn't mm -hmm. do it, which in hindsight, I regret I didn't get involved in it at an earlier stage, you know, so maybe not until... Very late twenties, I, I started getting involved in some community theatre. You know what I mean, and you know I liked okay. it. You know what I mean. Then into my thirty, I ended up going to university doing a creative, creative and performing arts degree. But um, oh, you got a degree, Patrick? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm performing oh, and creative oh, arts. I've done that. Um, graduated in two thousand six from Liverpool Hope, and you know, but the years building up to that, you know, almost maybe before I graduated, the eight, nine, ten years building up to that, I started getting involved in, in local theatre, you know what I mean, community theatre, short films. Chase is one of the people who I would say, if I remember right, was giving me my first little role in a, in a short movie. So, oh, you know... That's great. Uh, you were the lead. That's great. <laughs> so, you know, all these things helped me development, you know what I mean, got me more interested in writing, seeing how we structured scripts and how I structured and started then getting involved in writing classes, you know, and I've, I've been on, I couldn't say how many, but, you know, several, several writing courses over the years, you know what I mean? Some just community-based, some um, where you got a basic academic credit in, in the Liverpool University, you know what I mean? Writing for TV and film, writing for theatre and, and so on, where I've done like a year course there. You're very um, creative. Yeah, I mean, in so, you seem quite multi-talented, you know. Well, for me, it was about, because I was involved, and getting involved in writing, acting, looking at things on TV, thinking, I can do better than that. I can act better than that. I can write better than that. It was about, well, okay, I need to learn about this trade then. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, you know, I'm someone, whatever I'm learning about, or no, I can't know everything, but I don't like things to go over my head. So I want to know a little bit about everything. So by going into university, doing various training and courses, I started learning terminologies and trade terminologies and also the harsh realities of these industries are very difficult for anybody to get in. And when you're black, you know, the difficulty becomes not even twice as hard. It can become four or five and six times as hard because oh, of the, the racism and discrimination that's out there. And that's just the true nature of, of society, you know what I mean? And that's part of, part of the battle. You know I mean, that's the bigger part of the battle. So, you know, that, that's ongoing and, you know. So see, the, I, know, I know you're into poetry as well. Well, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, you know, initially when I started writing, the idea was to write play scripts, film scripts and so on. And um, I don't know how, to be honest, but, you know, consciously, subconsciously, listening to people like Levi Tafuara, who's a local oh, poet, yeah. 
um, getting to meet Lincoln Quasi Johnson when he performed at the Everyman one time, you know, bought mm. his book, he signed it, and, you know, little things like that made me think, well, the stuff these guys are chatting about, and I've lived some of that. You know what I mean? You know, they, some of their experience, I've got them experience as well growing up as a black youth in the inner city. So, you know, I've got something to say as well, you know, so let me give that a try. So ended up doing a lot more poetry than I envisaged rather than the, the playwright and the TV film writing and so on. So that's like, I wouldn't say sidetracked me, but it's just all part of writing development because, you know, even though it's only short in some senses, writing a poem is like writing a story because it has a beginning, middle and end or, well, mind you, in that thing, because it tells people something. I mean, people say, oh, mm. poems don't have to make sense, but I'm of the school of thought. So, well, why would I want to write something that doesn't make sense? Because to me, if something doesn't make sense, that means it's non well, no sense or nonsense. Well, funny <laughs> you say that, yeah. What, what I picked up with you anyway is you're not just a person who, well, well I just want to write because somebody else is writing. Or you, I get the, you've got the passion in a lot. Whatever you're, you seem to be doing, you seem to be having passion in whatever you're doing. Like you just said, you just said it before yourself when you said you knew you could do better than some of these other people's. Because you got some people, they just make music just to be heard, or it's there's no meaning to what they're saying. Mm. Did you ever have you ever delved into music or rap um, or any kind of no, music? No, I, I I did have a little dabble thinking. Well, let me try and put poetry to music, but for whatever reason, I'm just that's just not me. I think you'd be some good, people you, that's you know it's a, it's a natural inbuilt talent. I know you but, well, no, but I have wrote things which yeah. have been slightly adapted and you know turned into songs. Again, our man Chase was. Um, one of the forerunners in a music video that we made, you know, I wrote the lyrics, they got slightly adapted and we made a music video going back in um, go on, 2005, over 10, Something 15 like that. years ago now, maybe <laughs> yeah. more, you know what I mean, um, for Black History Month. And, I, you know, it was a really good video, you know what I mean? And like, why I write, you know, I've, as you people may know, I've got a book out well, of bring... Jamaicans, you know what I mean, which is a lighthearted yeah. tale for youngsters, for adults. Um, I've done a second edition of the same book, which is the same story. Yeah. Exact same story, just that it's got some pictures where the first one doesn't. Because I think when you're reading a book, it's all about imagination. If you want to see pictures and images, watch a movie. But, yeah. you know, I thought I'll just put some in because someone had commented on it and it played on my mind. But when I write generally, I want to write to teach people, to educate people, to enlighten people. You yeah. I mean, I write for fun, but it ain't no joke. Yeah. Because what I write is to make the four provoke. That's my motto. You know what I mean? If I, I like send you rhyme. an email, that's on the bottom of every email. Yeah. You know, and I write that, you know, on the bottom of me writing sometimes because so, that's what I want to do. I so, want to educate people. So if we go back to the beginning of this book, yeah, um, the three little Jamaicans. I heard you saying on uh, one of the radios about you, you've been waiting to bring this book out for a long time, was it? Well, yeah, because yeah. this book was first wrote as a radio play going back to a radio course that was on, I think it was in the Everyman. Um, Quite a while ago. And again, you know, I keep mentioning this guy. I think, you know, <laughs> Chase was on that same course going wow. back then. You know what I mean? This was in the early days when I was first getting to know him. He's everywhere, you know, isn't he? And we, um, <laughs> you know, so yeah, he has, in like many other people, been yeah. part of my development process as a writer. You know what I mean? So... Um, oh, that's it cool. was written originally as a radio course, and I think the course was in either 2004 or five. So you're talking 15, 16 years ago. Wow. It done, I'd done nothing with it for years because I thought, where do I get three little Jamaicans from in Liverpool to talk their accent? As, regardless how I sound, I can do a Jamaican accent quite clearly, yeah. convincingly, but not sound like a child. So I thought, well, I can't do it myself. You know what I mean? Is the new and, features to this book or what you read 15 years ago as a play? Is that the exact same, or have you added uh, added the, on? The or? skeleton of it is the same, but it did change. Okay, you know, not okay. dramatically, but at least you know it did change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, it developed, it went to a book and had a slightly different ending. Uh, or the book has a slightly different ending, or a different ending. You know, you can call it in, in the original radio play, which I would still, at some day, like to produce and do. You know what I mean? But in the format that the book is in, with that story and that same ending. Yeah. But um, would you ever do an audio book also? Well, like see, like the Chancellor Williams book, oh, you well, can yeah, also. Yeah, I think that, because I know people like that. You yeah, know I mean? think that'd it, be definitely something it, to it, add on to that. It's about going into all them markets, you know. Yeah. Because this book is, a, is an e-book available on Amazon. Amazon, and obviously it's also a print order book available on Amazon. And if you're local to Liverpool, 
at the moment. It's also in use from Nowhere Bookshop. Yeah. And the intention is to get it into one or two other bookshops, which you can't say yet because due to lockdown, they're not open yet. So still got to finalise things. But, you know, when it's available in a few more outlets across Liverpool, because everyone doesn't like online ordering. Yeah. But yeah, I like to write. I'm developing and writing more. I'm on a writing course at the moment. I'm, I'm going to be working with a professional writer just soon who's going to be mentoring me over the next few weeks. And I hope to find out a lot of information which is going to help my development and um, some of the ideas that I've got because it's always great having a great idea a lot of people come up with a great idea but the problem is, is how do you turn a great idea into a great story a great play a great film you know that's it creativity that, 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 you know? that's, that's where the difficulty comes you know anyone can come up with a plot that sounds great but then how do you pad that out to last an hour an hour and a half with, exactly. with the right dialogue, the right action, you know. So that's yeah. that's where you've got to really be creative. You know what I mean? Not, yeah. ju not just having the idea. So hopefully, you know, it's a long time. You know, sometimes a lot of the times life gets in the way. You can't dedicate as much time you can as to writing. You know what I mean? If someone was to say, "Well, here's a bursary," yeah, you don't yeah. have to get a job. You can uh, that can pay your way for the year. Right, right, right. Then, oh, that'd be that would be heaven for me. You know oh yeah. I mean? Well, you know what? Um, anybody who comes on this show, anyway, discovering, you know, it's the importance of African history, meaning whether you want to call it Black history, and obviously we, we you're going to define this in a minute, anyway. So the importance of African history because we get told the negative, the stereotypes. He was the only slave. People, Chicken George. It's always all that. You know, we have to elaborate a bit more. And I'd like you to explain, you know, whether it's the Nile Valley civilizations and the whole point where it started all this, you know, like uh, the pseudoscience and the ancient Egyptians wasn't black. And so, you know, you can um, give us give us um, some information well, yeah. on that. Just as an overview, um, I'll just finish off with two sentences about a writer because it crosses over into the history thing. OK, because as a writer, I'm a black man and you get pigeonholed into being called a black writer. And I think, well. That's not fair, because what does a black writer mean? I'm a writer. If I want to write a story about a black experience with all black characters, that still doesn't make me a black writer. It still makes me yeah. only a writer. When J.K. Rowland wrote Harry Potter, as far as I'm aware, there's no black characters in that. There may be, but as far as I'm aware, there isn't. But she's not called a white writer. So why should I be called a black writer? Yeah, of course. Simply because I'm writing about a certain type of person. So that, you know, and to me, that... It's the same thing carries over to history. Why are we call it black history? Because when I was in school learning about the Romans, the Saxons, the Normans, no one ever told me that's is white history because what I was seeing depicted in these stories was all white people. Even like, though yeah. as I've grown and learned more about history, there was a lot of black people involved in these same times. Yeah. But what I was taught and shown in school didn't depict them people. But it was never ever for once called white history, simply because it talked about the heritage of of, of 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 white Britain, you know what I mean? It's of like Romans Chinese, of, you, know, you know, they say Chinese so, history, you don't say yeah. any it, it colour was, history. It wasn't, it wasn't called yeah, that, yeah. so I think, well, it's unfair to call something black history, because to me, that means it sounds like you're saying it's not as important as history. History is the history of the world, which involves all different people from all over it. So whatever contribution they had of it, the fact that they're black still makes it history. It doesn't make it black history. I use the term black history, but I will always use it with the explanation that I've just given. Yeah, yeah. Or they'll call it black history. I'll say, no, it's actually world history because let's just use one example okay. where when I've been in a workshop in school and I've said to children, tell me something about black history. They'll always mention the slave trade. Always. So the first thing I'll say was, well, okay, when the slaves were taken to the Caribbean, to the Americas, who took them there and who enslaved them? And then they'll think and they'll say, well, the Europeans, the English, the French, the, the Spanish, white people. I say, well, ah, so why is it called black history then? Why are you calling it black history if you just mentioned white people took them over there? So therefore, it's European, it's African, it's black, it's yeah. white. It's just history. If we take away them colorings, it becomes history. So, you know, and to me, that's what it is. Because using that term history and black history, it makes one sound lesser than the other. Well, you know, like, the fascination of these pyramids that are in Egypt or whether they're in Sudan, but we, we obviously, you know, you're going to take walkers through it with Nile Valley. And why it's, you think it's so important to deal with Egypt? Well, for me, yeah. black history, history of the world is important. Depictions of Egypt are always of 
white Egyptian pharaohs and white this. You'll see, there's even been programs I've seen called the black pharaohs. And I thought, well, if you're calling them the black pharaohs and they never existed from um, like 700 BC or around them times, the 25th or 6th dynasty, mm. um, that means you're saying the people who actually built the pyramids in Giza, which were four and a half thousand years ago, were so-called mainstream, what they call, again, <laughs> these terms I'll always, I'm going to question them all the time because they say mainstream archaeologists or mainstream scientists says they're built then, where there's other people say they're a lot older. Yeah. So it discredits the other people who say they're a lot older by saying, well, if you're not mainstream, you're not as good, you're not as knowledgeable, you're not as this, you're not as that. Oh, but then these commercial. terminologies are the same, like calling someone a writer and calling someone a black writer. Yeah. A writer's better than a black writer. You know what I mean? So, so a, a black historian is not as good as a historian. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And so on and so on. And when someone's usually used the term historian, it usually refers to a white person. Yeah. Obviously, a black historian speaks for itself. Well, remember last time you, know, you mentioned so about prehistory and the, the term, the meaning of prehistory when the European writes, this is prehistory. Well, yeah. If you break it down. For me, the importance of why Egypt's important because it's depicted wrongly. Yeah. Here's an example. It wasn't even Egypt. The other day I was flicking through the TV and a film was starting. I wasn't even sure of the name. I think it was called Hot Chick, a mad name. It's not something I've, I've normally watched, but I've just seen the start <laughs> of it. But it said Abyssinia, 40 BC. And Abyssinia, as some people may know or may not know, is a name that we now know today as Ethiopia. Yeah. So when I see an Abyssinia, 40 BC, someone who's interested in history, stroke black history, that, that got my attention. So I thought, Ooh, what's this about? Let me watch this. So the, the first thing that got me and nearly fell off, lucky I was sitting down and I would have fell over, was the depiction of the king in Abyssinia in 40 BC. It was a white guy. And I just couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my, what is going on here? But this is how blatant, whether it be Hollywood or whoever, I'm not sure who was the producers of the movie, but, you know, as a generic term, Hollywood, this is what they do. Yeah. They, they wave a magic wand. And they just depict someone's history completely different. And the same with Egypt, because although I haven't had the pleasure yet to grace and walk through some of the tombs and the, and the sites that are of Egypt, due to the documentaries I've watched, the books that I've studied and, yeah. and, and looked at and read, the depictions on the walls, the statues, are clearly of black people. You know, without having Kodak cameras, they may as well have, because they clearly are, it's indisputable. Yeah. You know, the, the hairstyles, the, 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 the reconstruction, everything about them, the features, the, the, some of the artifacts they found, <coughs> the acro yeah. combs that they found, all these different things. You know, Queen mm -hmm. Tide depicted as an acro to, who said to be Tutankhamun's grandmother. Yeah. All, all these different things, some of the things which are said to be crowns, which when you look at the reality, are actually hairstyles, because some of these hairstyles are still worn to this day in parts of, of, of Africa where you know, due to invasion after invasion, a lot of the black Egyptians were, were pushed back there to sub-Saharan Africa yeah. and, and, and places like Burundi, Rwanda, um, what what is known as as as, um, as um, the Western Sudan, right um, which is not the west mm, of Sudan. It's exactly. a whole area that stretches from the east of Africa right across the land of the to, blacks to, 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 to West Arab, Africa. In Arabic way, the yeah. land of the blacks, it's not you know, so. Yeah. Um, all these different things depict black people, yeah. but yet still, any book I've ever read on Egypt, any documentary I've ever watched on Egypt, whether it be on the Discovery, BBC, doesn't matter, YouTube, every last one of them always tells about the people who built Egypt, migrated down the Nile or up the Nile, depending on your perspective, Yeah. went to the Nile Delta and built up Egypt. Yeah. yeah. So let's look at where down the Nile is what's located there, Ethiopia, Sudan, Uganda, these places which no yeah. one disputes are black countries. Exactly. No one, even a racist historian doesn't dispute that. Yeah. So if these people, and in any migration, everyone doesn't move lock, stock and battle. That, as far as I'm aware in history, that's never happened. So let's just say 5 million people lived there. All 5 million didn't migrate down the Nile and build Egypt. That's maybe half a million, maybe a hundred thousand. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. Just look at the, the history of migration in, in, in human history. Everyone never moves, just a handful of people move. But yet still, if a handful of people moved or thousands moved from these areas I've mentioned, Ethiopia, what we know as Ethiopia, Sudan, 
Uganda, them type of areas, yeah. and moved down the Nile and built up Egypt, then how could they not be black? There's exactly. one piece of evidence, the physical evidence of the depictions and the statues, the paintings, and um, what some ancient historians have even how they physically described them, you know, yeah. um, from whether it be Aristotle, Herodotus, all different types of people, how they've described them tells you they were black. Exactly. Yes. Well, how the Egyptians have depicted themselves in drawings on the wall where they've shown you, you know, um, the Egyptian, the Nubian, the this and that, both yeah. were black. But going back to what you said before, because this is interesting when you said, we don't actually, you know, with the dates of the pyramids that they give or the Great Sphinx, you know, you might say either Robert Baval and other people talking mm -hmm. about the water erosions on the Great Sphinx and yeah, yeah, yeah. possibly older, maybe they were built on grasslands. Yeah. There's and... a book by Robert Duval I've read. I can't remember the title of yeah. it, but I have read one of some of his and, and, and other people as well, not just... Yeah, yeah, yeah there's yeah, lots yeah. of people who say that, you know, things like the Wreck and the Sphinx is up to maybe 12,000 years 12 old. 12,500, yeah, yeah, know, yeah. Again, how do you prove it? Because science itself, and that's, I'll even use the word mainstream, mainstream science itself readily accepts that it's hard to determine the age of rock. Yeah, you can't, like you can get a plant and extract its its um, its DNA or the, not DNA, it's carbon dating things that yeah. you do. But even that's been shown to not be too reliable and they've mm. changed it. You know, it's not great changes, but it's changed and how old something is by, you know, it might have moved at 500 or 1,000 years. So it's not much when you're talking something's 12,000 years old to say, well, it might be 11,000. But it's hard to depict how old is rock. You know, some scientists have said, well, if these are based on um, depictions of what's on the night sky, then for them to do that would mean corresponds to that date of 12,000 because that's when the stars did align at that point, yeah. Leo and so on and so on in the constellations. It also coincides with the same point that um, weather patterns and study of weather patterns yeah. showed that, the, you know, it was because at the time when the great pyramids and sphinx were built, People see desert now. That wasn't desert. Exactly. It was lush, lush land. Big link You know there. what I mean? Because clearly, mm. um, for them to, to survive and, and to grow in that, they had to have lush land. Yeah. You couldn't live out in the desert. There's nothing there. You can't exactly. grow nothing there. So it'd be quite impossible to live there the way it is today. You know, some the pyramids themselves, even the Great Sphinx, the Great Sphinx was only fully uncovered. I think in the... I might be wrong, but let's just say... It was, I think it was in the 1930s where it was fully dug out. It was still buried in sand, half okay. of it. Yeah. You know, and up to yeah. the 1880s, 1890s, it was buried up to its head in sand and just a little bit of its head was peeking out of the sand. And some of that was removed in the times of a, 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 an English archaeologist called um, 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 Peachy. Um, so who, who wrote maybe 40 books about Egypt over the period from the 18, late 1880s right up until um, the 1930s. You know, we spent a lot of time and he, he's seen as some today as, as what they call the father of Egyptology. And, yeah. You know, I've read maybe five or six of his books, really interesting, and all of them talk about the same types of things, people migrating down the Nile. So if, if, if some Eurocentric scientists want to say, well, the Egyptian were black, then who lived in ancient Ethiopia, Sudan, who migrated down exactly. the line. He's saying there was a mysterious white race lived there, migrated <laughs> down the line. Your uh, built Egypt, <laughs> disappeared without trace in ancient Sudan and Ethiopia, and also disappeared without trace in ancient Egypt. It doesn't yeah. it doesn't actually make sense and the archaeological evidence doesn't doesn't back it up neither. If I could mention about um ocean crossing, well we, we usually say sea fan, but I want to deal with ocean crossing only because we are doubted that we could ever sail across the oceans. I mean, on no. the, look at the Indian Ocean. Uh, well, sorry, it's not called the Indian Ocean, is it? You know, how can India have an ocean? You know, it's impossible India could have an ocean. You could look at the size of Africa, then you got Australia. Well, seafaring, and how would people have got to Madagascar, Zanzibar, and these other places? You know, when you doubt Africans well, yeah, had the ability to navigate. There's a guy in... Um... Like the Egyptians clearly navigated the, the, the Nile is massive. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's that big. It has its own weather systems on it. Yeah. You know, so even just to sail on the Nile, you need decent sized ships yeah. and boats and so on. And clearly, we know the Egyptians did build these things. They depicted yeah. in pictures. One of them was found buried outside the pyramid, yeah. you know, which is quite big. And based on some of them designs, there's a guy, I'm not sure on his correct pronunciation, but a guy called, um, I don't know, 
I'm not sure if it was first time, it might be four, but four Hydra fell or something along them lines. But I'm quite sure it was in 1976, built a replica of a reed type boat that was used in ancient Egypt going back um, over 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Yeah. And proved that you can sail to the Americas in it. Exactly. It's not just that you can sail to the Americas in it, there's an actual, which still exists to this day, which I assume existed back then, there's a natural current. Oh, yeah. Where if you just sat in a bathtub, it will take you to the Americas. Yeah. And it can actually <laughs> take you back. That's so exactly. Whether it be by accident or knowledge, you the couldn't. They were able to get there based on that. And, 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 and I suppose Lady did go there. One quick thing before they be, we end out here. Um, see, some people who say, well, we're not Egyptians, we were West Africans, or we were people from Central Africa. Now, one time Africa was all united at one time because a lot of people think, oh, it's just tribe fighting with tribes. It seems like when this patrilineal system came in, because one time it was matrilineal, you know. Well, when you say united, I don't really mean, know what you mean by that. I mean, un under the, these, what they considered as God, basically, like when I say God, a supreme being, a super, like. No, well, or. The divine creator, I like or, Chancellor or, Williams. Or cultures have creation stories and supreme creators. Yeah. And ultimately, if you withered them all down, you could say, well, we all amount to the same But thing. not God like a man in the sky, in, I don't in, mean like in, that. In some you respects. Know. So, um, Africa, it's a massive place. Yeah. It's several times bigger than Europe. Yeah. So, it's a really big place. Massive, massive place. There's, there's, there's lakes. In, in certain parts of Africa and Ethiopia that are bigger than Wales itself. Yeah. You know, and then you, and there's big lakes in Wales. You know, I, would, I wouldn't go as far as to say Africa was all united because people are different. There's different tribes. There's different... When you have people building great pyramids in Egypt and you'd have great civilizations in, 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 in Southern Africa and great Zimbabwe, you had great civilizations in Western Africa. Um, in, in the Mali, the Songhai empires, you know, great civilizations yeah. that I would argue preceded the great Egyptians because the people who migrated down the Nile migrated with the knowledge to build Egypt. Yeah. They might have developed it there and mastered it and became greater than the, 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 the people that they left, but nevertheless, yeah. they left with a certain amount of scientific, medical, astronomical, archaeological knowledge to be able to go there and develop Egypt. You didn't just learn that in like a 50-year oh, period. Course. These things must have been learned over a long period Basically, of time. Basically, spirituality. It, was like, it seemed like it was a common spirituality, what they all shared. At well, one, at one, before any invasions I'm talking about. Yeah, spirituality. Before Again, I'm not no expert on it, but looking on it, everyone yeah. has their own different spiritual beliefs. Yeah. So therefore, I wouldn't call it all one. It might you can call it all one because they're all based it on some form of spirituality. Yeah, belief, yeah, yeah. But it's Nature. not all one and the same because it's like Nature. saying because all most Europeans are depicted as white that they're all the same, but they're not. They're clearly different. They've got different cultures, different languages, different a lot of things. You know, two great world wars were fought just recently. You yeah, know, there's people who are still alive who fought in them over these differences. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, people in Africa had conflict. We go so far way. back. With us being, we, some people say 200,000 years, 300,000 years, because we're so far back. When you're talking about Europeans, this is a lay thing, or whether you're talking about Asians. So we're in Africa. Spirituality must have begun a long time, even before people migrated from Africa. Well, yeah, spirituality. Because I go in Asia, no, again, and they seem similar, like these tribes. It's not something which I've researched or looked into, but just yeah. on a general and basic knowledge of it. Yeah. And um, spirituality is in many cultures. Yeah. You know, yeah. not just African cultures, because you can have um, you know, depends what you call spirit, how do you define it? You know yeah. what I mean? You know, there's, there's a lot of different definitions but, of it. People could say the old Norse traditions, that's a form of spirituality. Yeah. Believing in this and believing in that. You know, the Greeks did they have a form of spirituality? Africans, you still yeah. have that today. You know, so that's that's a different thing, you know what I mean? And to me, it's, it's neither here nor there. What, well, what you know I what? think is important is black history stroke world history or yeah. world history stroke black history is important to, to get rid of negative stereotypes because yeah. people say, oh, racism didn't exist back then and it didn't. But you know what, Patrick? Well, you know what? Because we're coming to the very end, and I think we've even gone over the time, but we're going to have you back on again anyway. Well, yeah, so, there's a lot more, but I just yeah, want to yeah. finish on this last you point, know. because when it comes to racism, racism is a modern construct. That's it. Even at the beginning of slavery, racism didn't exist then. Yeah. Racism 
was developed during slavery in order to justify its continuation yeah. and to justify then going into Africa and colonizing it. So yeah. we had pseudo scientists coming up with the inferior black man, the inferior this, to justify the subjugation of black people yeah. to, and to, to keep that going on, to say, well, we have to do this to better Europe because these people are just the same as the cow that we use to plow the fields. Yeah. You know what I mean? The fact they've got two legs and limbs like us is irrelevant. So exactly. there's a monkey, but we don't say it's the same as us. And, and these are just equivalent to that. They have no knowledge. They have no history. They have no nothing, which a lot of the people, some of them actually believe that because they had no other base knowledge, but we all have to continue many of them stuff. did know it was a lie because they knew the history of well, Africa yeah. and were part in destroying some of this history, hiding it, and they've all got it in the museums throughout the whole of Europe. We're going to continue this though, Patrick, anyway, but um, thanks for coming on the show anyway and um, discovering new things and we're going to have you back again. Unfortunately, the time, you know, it's one no, of those things. I understand. You know me, I keep it yeah. on going, but like, it's a time's cut short and thin and we've gone over it anyway, but Thank you very much anyway, and we're going to have you back again. We'll continue all this. Yeah, thanks for having me. As I said, it's been a pleasure. And as I said, conversations like this, you cannot cover it in half an hour. You cannot cover it in a lifetime. So that just shows you, but it's a lot of information. <laughs> we do the best we can No do. one can know everything, and no one should try to know everything. But you need to know what you can know. And it's all good knowledge because it helps confidence, it helps build, and it helps break down the racial divides. And, and bring people together so people need to know every about, about everybody well thank you very much anyway i'm james debo your host and we're going to end it out now on big condo radio and thank you very much for coming yeah thank you and thank you to our host big condo and to chase who's been our technician today <laughs>